Welcome to the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research. My name is Julia Rothkopf, and I am the program associate at YIVO. Today we have YIVO's reference and outreach archivist, Ruby Lando Pankus, who is joining us to present a workshop on how to pursue a research project using YIVO's archives and library. For those of you who do not know YIVO, we are a very special place for the celebration, contemplation, exploration of Yiddish and Eastern European Jewish culture. We are located in New York City, where our library and archive contain over 24 million documents and 400,000 books. These re resources are used by researchers from all around the world. We also have lots of classes on Yiddish language and culture, exhibitions and public programs just like this one, where we aim to bridge the worlds of Jewish culture and our vast library and archival collections. And we are so excited to have you all joining us today for this program. Ruby Lando Pincus is YIVO's reference and outreach archivist. She holds a BA in Yiddish studies from Columbia University and is currently earning her Master of Library and Information Science degree with an emphasis in archival studies from the University of Missouri. She loves her work with YIVO and it allows her to meet a huge range of people from established researchers to people who are just beginning to explore the wild, wide world of Yiddishkeit that YIVO has to offer. Now I will hand it over to Ruby. Hello, everyone. It's so great to see you all here today. I'm going to share my screen. Um, <laughs> here we go. Okay. Um, oh, I'm not seeing it now. Are you all seeing? What are you all seeing? Um, hold on just a second. Slight technical difficulties. Um, I had it shared before and then <laughs> I closed out of it and now I'm having to, okay, that should be good. Are you all seeing okay? Looks great. Thank you. Um, all right, I'll put it in slideshow view. Okay, hello everyone. It is so great to see you all here today. Thank you all for showing up. I see some familiar names in the chat, but also some new ones. That's really great. This is very exciting for me. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Um, for those of you I haven't met, as Julia said already, uh, my name is Ruby Landau Pincus, and I'm the reference and outreach archivist here at Evo. This is actually the fourth talk in a, in a series that was started by my colleague Halal Yadin, and recordings of the previous sessions, which go into more depth about accessing Evo materials, can be found on our website. Um, one thing to note about those previous sessions is that they note that, that records of many of our collections are difficult to find in our online catalog. This is no longer the case. Um, our collections have been made significantly more searchable through the diligent work of archivists and volunteers. And with a few exceptions, our online catalog is almost completely in sync with our physical holdings now. In this program, we're going to go over some of the basics of archival research, including developing strong research questions, finding primary and secondary sources to propel your research, um, using archives and libraries, and keeping track of sources. I'm aiming this towards people who know they want to take on some sort of research, but don't know where to start. Um, if you're taking on a less formal project, wanting to dig through archival materials for fun, or you're already well-versed in this kind of research, you're more than welcome to stick around, but you may find more of what you're looking for in the earlier videos of the series. Uh, before you begin your research, it's important to be clear with yourself about your end goal. Uh, knowing the form you want your completed research to take on is crucial to ensuring that the amount and type of research you're doing is going to be represented well in your project. Do not do a book's worth of research if you are not writing a book. It's easy to get caught in the weeds and to do more research than you're able to wrangle into your article. There will, of course, always be materials you don't end up using. And there are many cases where articles turn into books. I don't mean to discourage you from going above and beyond in your research, but it's necessary to set out an end goal and a time frame when you're beginning your research. In short, know your scope. The next important point is to know the scope of your own abilities and existing knowledge. If you're hoping to read the original documents of Yiddish speakers, can you read Yiddish? If not, are you able to pay a translator? Yivo, like many other archives, does not translate its own archival materials. Do you have the time to wait for a translation, or are you on a shorter deadline? If you're on a shorter deadline, you may have to consider that your research will have to make use of secondary rather than primary sources and rely on translations by other scholars. Similarly, if you're interested in viewing materials at an archive like YIVO, are you able to come into the reading room to view materials in person? If not, are you prepared to accept the time and quality constraints of having reference photos taken? 
When taking on research that falls outside of your own capabilities, it can be very helpful to enlist the assistance of others, like librarians, archivists, research assistants, and translators, but getting outside assistance often has associated time costs and monetary costs. If these are not something you are prepared to take on for your project, you may need to consider changing the scope of your work to something that you can approach more independently. Sorry, <laughs> my little notes here. Um, uh, with these logistical factors out of the way, you should be able to start refining your research question or questions. It can be easy to feel like a broad research question will be easier to answer than a narrower one, but this is often not the case. For example, say you're interested in the lives of Jewish women. It's an understandable interest, but it makes for a really broad research question. If you ask me to find you material on Jewish women, I'm just as likely to find you material on Barbara Streisand as I am to find you material on Glickelob Hamelm. Technically, the lives of both of these women fit within the scope of your question. In all likelihood, though, you're more interested in one than the other, or neither of them. Among other distinctions, these two women are separated by location and era. When you've been thinking about a topic for a long time, it's easy to feel like the era and location should be self-evident and to not include them in your research queries. I've seen this happen a lot, and I've been guilty of it in my own research. Specifying era and location is a great way to narrow the scope of your research, and it will make your findings much more precise. Even if you feel like your question spans locations and eras, it will be very useful to break it, sorry, it will be very useful to break the question down into more specific questions for research. Once you've broken down your research question, you can start identifying resources. The key here is to try to not to repeat work that has already been done by other researchers. You don't need to waste your time. Uh, well, I know it can be tempting to start wading through archives immediately. I highly recommend starting with scholarly sources. Not only have a lot of researchers done really great work, likely adjacent to the topics you're interested in, but following their citations can be a really great way to find primary sources and scholarly sources that are relevant to your work. If you don't know where to start, you can try searching for books and articles related to your research through sites like Google Scholar. Alternatively, you can find collections of scholarly sources through bibliographies, like Oxford bibliographies. So I'll click through here. And you'll see if we click browse by subject, we can click browse all subjects. And if I go to why, always my favorite because that's where they keep the Yiddish. If I scroll down, we can find Yiddish avant-garde theater. So this gets actually very granular on the level of uh, these bibliographies. And if we scroll down, we can see that they have this huge list of sources already picked out for us, right? Um, it's a curated list of great secondary sources. Um, and on a similar note, a lot of institutions will create libguides, which are web pages with resources related to a given theme. Um, if I click through here, this is a Yiddish, uh, this is a Yiddish libguide uh, by the New York Public Library. Um, and we can click around and it has all these great different sections with different reference resources, lots of different things that you could, I, I can't say that it's everything you might possibly need because who knows what you're researching, but uh, these are can be great jumping off points for your research. Um, uh, oh, and to find these, you can uh, generally just run a Google search of the name of the topic you're looking for, followed by libguide. Um, lots of libraries do these, they shouldn't be too hard to find. All right. Um, so if you identify a, a book or journal that contains information you're interested in seeing, it's worth checking first with your local library to see if it's available. If it's not though, you usually have more options. This is a website called WorldCat. Uh, you can use it to search the catalogs of over 16,000 libraries. It's very comprehensive. Um, even if you're not able to visit a library in person, many of these libraries are able to scan chapters for you. If I search here for Jewish aspects in avant-garde, which was one of the sources uh, mentioned in that Oxford bibliography, I can just run the search here and I find the book here and I'll see that it is in over a thousand of the libraries that they index from. And what I can actually do here is narrow this down to a 25 mile radius around my computer. And then it shows only 35 libraries here, right? Or it's in, it has six editions. We can say we want, uh, we can press view all formats and editions. We can look at all of these. I'll go back. Um, 
my point, <laughs> my point being here, um, if you find somewhere where you think you may be able to access it, you can click the borrow button and it should take you right to the, their page. Now, what we're going to notice here is that it actually doesn't show up when we click through to the NYPL. Um, sorry, I, <laughs> I gotta turn my page. Um, uh, these sites don't always talk to each other quite correctly. Um, so I'll have to type it in again. Um, Jewish aspects in avant-garde. I've searched it already. I've done a little bit of <laughs> preparation. Um, and then we can see it here. And we'll see uh, that the book is only available for on-site use or that you can request scans of it. Um, I don't have time to go too much further into this, but it's worth exploring your options across various libraries. Some of them will offer scans, some you'll be able to get through interlibrary loan programs. There are a lot of different options for accessing materials like these. Um, all right, going back. Okay, so zooming back out, after you've taken these steps, hopefully what you found in scholarly sources is that you already have most of the information you need for your project. Or you have a better idea of what archival material exists in terms of what you're looking for. Your questions should be getting much more granular. Um, from here, try to imagine what your ideal, most straightforward archival resource would look like. If you're hoping to find quantifiable details about someone's life, for example, you may have more success looking at vital records than at personal correspondence. While the perfect resource may not always exist, especially in Jewish and Yiddish studies where so many materials have been destroyed, knowing what kind of information you're looking for can vastly improve your success in research and keep you from getting bogged down in sources that are unlikely to give you the information you're looking for. I know that sounds kind of... Uh, obvious in many ways, but um, the reason I mention it is that it's easy to think, oh, if I'm looking for materials on Barbara Streisand, I'll just search Barbara Streisand. But when I, what I'm really looking for is a critical reception to her, um, her movie Yentl. And just searching Barbara Streisand is not going to get me there. You need to get more specific about what you want when you're looking through archival materials, which are going to be very specific rather than broader. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to find where it was in my notes. Um, yes, okay. Uh, it's also worth keeping in mind that archival research is generally pretty time consuming. While for your sake, I hope you find what you're looking for quickly, you'll likely have to spend a lot of time treasure hunting. Um, you can still learn a lot from the materials you don't end up using. Now do we get to talk about YIVO? Yes! <laughs> Um, I'll start with the bad news. YIVO doesn't have everything. Uh, for one, we don't really collect vital records. We have some that are fragmentary, but this is something that we generally leave to other organizations, which are better equipped for handling that kind of material and the types of research it is used for. Also, most of our materials focus on Eastern Europe and American Jewish experiences. We do have some materials uh, about other places, and there are many wonderful archives that focus on materials from other parts of the world, but it's not our niche. And so the further you, your research falls from that general scope, the less likely you are to have uh, the less likely you are to find it here. Also, a lot of archival material is unique. There are a lot of materials that fall perfectly within the scope of what we collect that we don't have just because they're at a different archive. Uh, I'll talk more about how to find materials in other archives shortly. The good news is that Yivo does have a lot. Uh, the strength of our archives uh, lies in our collections on pre-war Jewish life, the Holocaust, theater, sound recordings, photos and film, immigration, Yiddish, and labor. Uh, we also have large collections from immigrant benevolent societies and records from a number of immigrant aid associations, including the Holocaust-era case files of the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Okay, I'll check in on the chat really quickly. I'm sorry if I'm speaking too quickly. Um, I'm happy to clarify anything in the Q&A later on. All right. Okay. Um, we have two websites that you can use for searching our catalog. I'm not going to get too into the weeds with this uh, because Hillel covered it pretty extensively in the other sessions in the series, but I'll give you a primer. Um, it can be a little bit confusing, so I'll start by saying that if you want to zone out for the next minute, your main takeaway should be that it can't hurt to search both sites. So first, we have search.cjh.org. 
This website serves as our discovery layer, which means that it searches our archives and our library together in one search. Here, if we search for Kaczorginski, we'll get results that are archival materials, library books, and periodicals. So here we have archival materials, here we have a book, we have visual material, there's a lot here. If we want to view the finding aid from one of the archival materials, we can click through it like this. So I click here, I scroll down, I click digital finding aid, and then here I am. Sometimes it'll say something slightly different from digital finding aid. Uh, all of these look a, a, a little bit different, or we're, this is something we're working on uh, getting more standard. Um, but if you click around some, you will likely find something. <laughs> um, okay, and then after this, we have archives.cjh.org. Uh, this is our archive catalog. It does not search library material, but it searches archival material more deeply than the discovery layer because it can search within the text of a finding aid rather than just a title and basic metadata. It's also the easiest way to access our digitized materials. If I search Kaczorginski here, you'll see that by that clicking through takes me to the, uh, to the same finding aid right here. So when a collection has digitized material, you can access it by clicking into a folder on the right side of the screen. So say I wanted to see uh, this map of the Vilna ghetto. And then I get this button that says view online. And if I click that, it takes me to this page. It always takes me a little bit longer to load when I'm sharing my screen, um, which is very convenient. Um, <laughs> but if I wait here, Yes. Okay. So then you see I can scroll through and we have this material digitized. Um, not all of our materials are digitized, but this is how you view the ones that are. And we'll talk a little bit more about ones that are not in a bit. You'll also notice that um, both of these searches also search the materials held by other partner institutions at the Center for Jewish History. If you want to search YIVO materials specifically, uh, you can filter for them. But otherwise, it's a great way to search across multiple archives at once. Um, okay, so if you identify resources that are not digitized that you'd like to see in person, you can set up an appointment to view them in our reading room here at the Center for Jewish History. Julia will put a link to, in the chat for the website where you can make appointments and request materials for your visit. The reading room is open from 9.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m., Mondays through Thursdays, with the exception of federal and Jewish holidays, all of which will be noted on the calendar when you set up your appointment. I should note that while YIVO archivists page material for the reading room, we are not able to sit with you in the reading room and help you interpret what you're finding. This isn't to say that we can't help at all, uh, just that we're generally not able to work through individual materials with you. If you have any questions at all, though, I will be reachable by uh, email before, during, and after your visit at reference at YIVO.org. If you find a really great material here that you think you will really want to use for your research, but it's not digitized and you're not able to come in to view it in person, we have a form you can fill out to request up to an hour's worth of free reference photography. These aren't high quality photos, but they are legible. Um, I take them with this fun little document camera that I have right here. Um, I can photograph about 400 pages in, in an hour with this. So keep that in mind when you're making your requests. Um, one other thing to keep in mind is to give a couple of weeks of lead time on requests like this. Um, we get a lot of requests and I'm the only person taking these photos, so I can't always photograph materials right away. Um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me again at reference at evo.org. Okay, I've talked a lot today about materials that you cannot find here. So if you can't find them here, where can you find them? If you remember our WorldCat search from earlier, you may be wondering if there's an archival equivalent. There is. This is ArchiveGrid, and uh, Julia will put a link in the chat. Okay. Uh, ArchiveGrid is a bit less developed than WorldCat, but it indexes the materials of about uh, 1,500 participating collections. This is a great first search to make if you're pretty sure a material exists, exists somewhere, but you aren't sure where. So for example, say you're interested in Isaac Bashevis Singer's papers. Maybe you'd think they'd be at YIVO or at the New York Public Library, but you actually wouldn't find much through those searches. 
So if I search for him here, here's what we'll find. Isaac Bashev is a singer. And we can scroll down. We see there's some at Evo. There's some at Columbia. And then we see University of Texas at Austin. And we see this collection here. And New York Public Library comes up. University of Texas at Austin comes up again. Paul Crush collection. And bingo, Isaac Bashevis Singer Papers at the University of Texas at Austin. And this is the kind of thing that you is hard to know that it exists where it exists unless you run a search like this. You, you have to, this is how you find out where this kind of material is. And you wouldn't necessarily expect this to be at the University of Texas. Um, but from here, you can click through to their site. So if I click view catalog record, we can scroll down here and we see that there's an unpublished finding aid linked here. And if I click on that, broken link. <laughs> so uh, once again, I will run a search on their site. This is like what we did with the NYPL example. These websites don't always talk to each other super well. Um, but if I click here, we can see this inventory of his papers in their collections. And you see this is a huge collection. It is 77 linear feet. That means the boxes in physical space take up 77 feet. Huge collection. This is the largest collection of Isaac Bashevis Singer materials. Um, so if you scroll down here, you can read through this little biographical sketch. You can read through the sources. There's a scope note. This is fantastic. And then we get to these uh, series descriptions that start to tell us what kind of materials we can expect to find in here. And then we can get even more granular than that. And we, okay, it goes through the materials that have been taken out of the collection. We can scroll past this, uh, index terms, and then we get to the container list. And here's where we see what is in each box folder by folder. This is fantastic. And you'll notice that these materials are not digitized, but this is the kind of thing where if you were to reach out to the University of Texas, they would likely be able to scan some of these materials for you, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, I will go back to my slides. Okay, another great option is the SNAC Cooperative. Uh, that stands for Social Network and Archival Context. So this site is uh, suited more for searching names of individuals, like we just did, um, than for broader concepts. So while you might go to somewhere like Archive Grid to look up, say, Jewish Labor Bund materials, uh, that's actually maybe a bad example because they might appear as an agent here. But uh, if you wanted to search something about like a broader movement, you could maybe go to Archive Grid for that. Uh, SNAP would be less apt for that, but very apt for searching individuals. So if I search here for Isaac Bashev Singer, we find this great page that has all of this little biographical information on him. But then we, if we go to resources, we see 71 entries of, of um, materials about him. Materials that he's either referenced in, creator of, they have a few different uh, categorizations here. And this is another useful way to find things about individuals. Um, the website is a little bit friendlier. Um, it does not index as many resources though. So again, one of these things where it is useful to search both. Okay. Um, so once you've found some great archival resources and begun to delve into them, uh, you may start to wonder about how to use them in your work. Questions about rights and permissions can be tricky with archival materials. Uh, while many are long out of copyright, others may be harder to, to determine the status of. If you're hoping to incorporate archival images into a work, you should determine whether the archive has restrictions around the use of their images. YIVO's guide to copyright can be found at the link that's being posted in the chat. But if you ever have any doubt about the rights to something you're using in your work, the archive you're working with will likely have a point person for questions about rights. Here, it's Evo, here at Evo, it's my colleague Vital Zaika, who you can reach at photofilm at evo.org, which should also be in the chat. Um, another important point has to do with citations. You may have noticed when looking through bibliographies that you were not able to track down archival material cited in one of your resources. Often, the reason for that is that the location of the material is not well cited. 
When you're citing archival material, be sure to include as much location information as you possibly can in your citation. Not just the name of the archive, but also the name of the collection and the box and folder numbers, if possible. This isn't just for the point of giving props to your favorite Yiddish archive, it's primarily so that future researchers can build on your research and look to the same sources, the same way that you probably did earlier in your writing process. These citations are something to keep in mind throughout because it can be easy to lose track of location information on archival materials. This is why I recommend using a, a citation software like Zotero. Zotero is a free program that lets you save information about your sources alongside notes on them and can automatically generate citations based on the information you give it. If you put your sources in Zotero through, uh, throughout your research, you won't have to scramble to find them all again when you go to make your bibliography. Tracking your sources can also make your own research easier. I say this not to shame anyone because this is definitely something I've done. Uh, and I think this is something everyone's done, but I've gotten so many emails from wonderful researchers who remember having read somewhere about some article they wanted to read that they no longer have the citation information for, nor do they remember what book they found the citation in. While I'm always open to try to help track something like that down, I'm not always able to, and tracking your sources while you research is a great way to prevent this and save time in the long run. Um. Oh, I'm running short. <laughs> um, I do want to wrap up so we can move on to a Q&A session. But before we do, I want to highlight one more thing. Um, one thing you may have noticed throughout what I talked about today is that working in archives means working with people. A lot of what I threw at you can be really confusing, even if you're the best researcher ever. And what I really want to drive home is that you don't have to go at it alone. Uh, people working in libraries and archives have a vested interest in you finding what you need. Asking questions can get you to what you need much faster than trying to find everything you need on your own. Uh, we can even help you uncover materials that are nowhere to be found online. If you have any questions about your project, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at reference at evo.org. Even if I'm not able to help you directly, there's a very good chance I'll be able to point you towards someone who can. It's my job. Um, I also offer virtual reference appointments to anyone who books an appointment with me through Calendly, and I love to hear what you're working on. These appointments are half an hour long, about sometimes you can run over, um, and they're a great way to workshop any research plans you might have, and we can work together to get a sense of what the archives might have for you or which other resources might be better suited to your work. Um, sometimes you may have bigger questions than can be dealt with over email, and that's okay. That's why we have this. Um, and with that, I did want to wrap up this uh, presentation and move on to the Q&A portion. I'm sorry I spoke so quickly, um, but I am excited uh, to have a chance to hear from you all. Thank you. Great, great. thank you, Ruby. Um, we can stop the screen share for now. Oh, yep. Okay. Great. So thank you so much to Ruby for that wonderful presentation. If you have any questions um, that you'd like us to get to in our Q&A session, please put them in the Q&A function on Zoom, not the chat. Um, and we will be sure to get to as many as we can. All right. So first to start, um, thank you so much for telling us about all those different resources. Um, some were unfamiliar to me and I work at Evo. So thank you. And um, so I guess my question is, when you start a research project and you, okay, you've done your preliminary pre preliminary research, you know sort of what direction you want to go in, you have your research question, you know your scope, um, and now you just need to find the primary source materials that you would like to work with. Where do you suggest people start? Do you suggest they start with archive bread and snack, or do you suggest that they just sort of start looking in different libraries and then turn to those resources once they, um, when, if they feel stuck. Um, so wh where do people begin once they are ready to actually start doing the nitty gritty research? Um, I really recommend looking to bibliographies first. Um, like I showed in one of my earlier slides, I think that if you've read a book that you've found really in interesting information in, uh, you look to their bibliography, you find out which archival resources they used, and you try to track those down yourself. Um, that's not uh, plagiarism, that is sharing resources. Um, it's very useful, and uh, these archival materials are out there to be used by anyone. 
Um, and usually if you find, if you, if you go in that direction, even if the exact material doesn't end up being something that you end up using, it is likely that there are other materials around it, the same archive in the same collection that will be useful to you. Um, so that is where I would recommend starting getting into archives, um, not just diving in head first, but uh, by taking the lead of the people who have done research before you. Hey, wonderful. Um, that is very, very helpful. Um, so we have a question about Giddish names and how to research those. Um, so the question is that there are many alternate spellings for Yiddish names. We have Evo Standard. We have these more Americanized spellings. Um, what suggestions do you have for approaching searching Yiddish names in any of these databases? Um, because the options can certainly balloon um, when the first and last names have many different variant spellings. Um, yes, this this is an issue I know well, and it's something I run into quite a lot um one thing i use frequently and nothing here is going to be perfect none of this is going to be the perfect answer to this because the world of names is very confusing um one thing i often do is i use a wildcard search um a lot of uh searches that you use including evos will have certain characters that you can put into um into your search terms that can substitute in any letter so in the evo searches that's the asterisk if i put an asterisk it can fill in any number of any letters there um asterisk is a pretty common one you'll also see the um i'm totally blanking on the name for it other than hashtag um i that's embarrassing um the number sign. There we go. Uh, <laughs> um, but that can be really useful. So, it, for example, if you have a name that could be, um, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, if I have the name Chaim, and I don't know if it's being spelled with a CH or a KH at the beginning or what, I might put asterisk H-A-I-M, and then it will show everything that has that shorter string within it. And you can also put that in in the middle of words. And that, again, you do end up with this issue of the of things ballooning out with that sometimes because there might be other names that share those same first and last letters that are not actually the same whatsoever. Um, this can become difficult when you're working with common names also. Um, what can be helpful is to try and get more specific in other ways. If there are, uh, if there's anyone you know with a name that is uh, less uh, permutable that you can um, that you can add to that search. If there are any dates, you know, any locations, you know, these are all things that can, um, that can be helpful here. Oh yes. Thank you. Halal. Uh, Boolean operators are very useful for this. Um, uh, much appreciated. Um, that th those are my main tips. I, it also just involves searching a lot of different variations. It, sometimes it can be a little bit clunky. I like to keep track of which ones I've already searched. I'll make a little list um, so I don't end up going back to the same ones over and over again. Um, I guess that's what I'd recommend. It's not an exact science by any means. All right, wonderful. And thank you, Hillel, for that note in the chat. Hillel is one of our other archivists, um, and she has done our previous three sessions of how to do research at Evo. Yes, I highly now, recommend it. Continuing. So we're very happy to have them both involved. Um, okay, so I think a lot of your presentation was about, I think, pretty broad in that it can apply to both seasoned researchers and scholars, as well as more amateur scholars and people who are just doing research for fun. Um, so we have a question about how to, so you come to Evo, you come to the reading room and then what? You're not a scholar, you aren't very familiar with our resources. Um, 
not not a just just you, you know a little bit of Yiddish you don't know a lot of Yiddish how do you navigate that if you want to come to Evo to do research but you're not um but you're not actually conducting a your project is not going to turn into a book on a university press um how do you navigate just sort of doing research for fun um yeah that, it's an, that's an interesting question because it's maybe less directed by this whole citation thing um ultimately i think what i would recommend is identifying on our website some materials that you are interested in before you come in um whether that's through a catalog search whether you saw something in an article uh our staff in the reading room can be very uh helpful for this um helping you figure out like what the collection name is for something that you found or you can email me directly and i can help you find that and that's something that you could uh, request ahead of time or you can request when you come into the reading room. I do recommend making an appointment. We can sometimes ac accommodate walk-ins, but it's generally better to make an appointment. Um, and then when you go from there, I guess what I would recommend is um, either bringing a computer with you or using one of the computers that we have available there in the reading room to then uh, build off of what you found, see if there's anything else that's of interest to you and requesting that. It is, a, it, it can be a little bit frustrating to try to do a browsing sort of thing from the reading room because we don't let people into our stacks to just uh, browse. But, um, but this means that when you do want to browse, that's something that you sort of carry out maybe more on the online catalog, and then you view the physical materials in person that you've already uh, found online, if that makes sense. Julia, am I making sense? <laughs> Thank you. All right, great. Um, so we have a bunch of questions about um, different aspects of our archive. So you have the like the reference and outreach part of it, and you directly handled people's um, reference questions um but then we also of course take donations of archival objects so that's where our um 400,000 books and 24 million documents come from it's donations um so if someone would like to contribute or donate um any materials they might have sitting at home or that they've inherited from a family member how would they how should they go about that um they should email me um if you email me and tell me what you're looking to donate um whether that's books, uh, other sorts of materials, uh, reference at evo.org, email me, and I will let you know um, if, I, if I feel like uh, these are materials we'd be interested in accessioning, and I can pass that along to our accessioning archivist. Um, there are cases generally with books where we may have to turn things down. Um, our library collection is very large and we are generally not able to accept duplicate materials um we are in a manhattan building <laughs> uh we have limited space um and while we are sure that the books that you have are absolutely wonderful um if we already have copies of them uh we find that our space um is better saved if we um don't take on more than one copy of things great but yes, email um, is the yes. short answer. And, and I keep putting Ruby's email um, email reference at yibo.org in the chat. Um, wonderful resource. You can email Ruby with absolutely any questions, um, research questions, um, archival questions, anything you might have, and she will certainly get back to you. Um, she does have a high volume of inquiries, so um, she might not get back to you that exact day, but certainly within a few business days. Okay, so we have many, many more questions. I don't think we will be able to get to all of them today, um, but we have another question about genealogical research, and um, is YIVO a good place to do that um, rather than this more academic research that we were mainly focusing on in this presentation? So genealogical research at UVO is interesting because we do have some collections that can be really useful for genealogical research, but it's pretty specific to uh, where, like, what uh, groups your family was part of, what your, like, where your family lived, what, what your family interacted with. Um, sorry, that is a long-winded way of saying we don't have a lot of vital records, and that's 
what a lot of people are talking about when they're wanting to do genealogy research. Um, but there are a lot of other types of records that we do have. We have a lot of records from immigration organizations. We have a lot of records from uh, Landsmannschaften, so uh, immigrant benevolent societies. Um, if, if you already have a good sense of the kind of material you're looking for, like what... Um, where this family member of yours was based say where like if they were part of any of these um communities um that we have records on in those cases we can be very useful for genealogy research um if you're like if you have a relative who is buried um in an area like who was part of a Landsmannschaft, an immigrant um benevolent association um you uh you may be able to find cemetery records uh for that association in our um in our collections but for other things like birth certificates death certificates those are not what we specialize in um we do have a great page about family history research um julia would you mind pulling that up the yuvo family history research page um and that links out a lot more and spells out better much better than i just did what we have here and what we don't have here um there are uh there are a lot of organizations uh, working in the Jewish genealogy space right now, and um, I am happy to direct you towards any of those or towards materials of ours that may be helpful. Okay, great. Um, that is really helpful. I know that a lot of people are very interested in knowing more about their own family history, um, and so it's great to know what Yibo does have and what Yibo doesn't have, so people can make a more um, educated decision about where to pursue that research. That that research. Um, so we have another question about um, coming into the archive and making an appointment to view our archival collections and our holdings. So can someone make, how far in advance can people make an appointment? Um, can they make an appointment several months from now? Does it have to be within a certain, um, a time span of a few weeks. What is the process for making an appointment? I believe you're generally able to make appointments months ahead. That is something I would have to double check on. Um, but generally, I think that that's possible. Um, it is th all through that um, th the website, the library website, which I can link again. Um, library services. Here we go. Um, so it's all through there. When you go in, you'll see the calendar of dates that you can uh, make appointments for. Um, generally, uh, the reading room side of things is handled uh, by the Center for Jewish History staff. Um, it's less something that we have control over here, um, but we are <laughs> evidently in contact with them and we can put you in contact with them if you have any questions. Great. Um, there's another question about photographs um, and if we collect those. So that's one part of it. Like, is that is donating photographs photographs separate than the process of donating books or any other kinds of archival materials? I mean, sort of on that same wavelength, do we have a lot of photographs digitized as well? Or would people have to come into our archive to look at photographs? Um, so uh, yes, uh, with regards to uh, donating photographs, that is, again, something that you would email me about, reference at evo.org, um, and we'd see if they would be a good fit for our collection. Um, as for viewing digitized photographs, we do have a lot of photographs digitized. One of our best um, resources for viewing them is this website, uh, People of a Thousand Towns. Um, it's it's a bit of an old website. It's a little bit funky to use. I'm putting a link in the chat. Um, this website has thousands of thousands of um, images from uh, various shtetls um, uh, prior to the Holocaust. We also have we also have lots of other photos in our archives, but this is 
a large, large digitized chunk of them and they're searchable. Um, you do have to make an account on this website to uh, search them. Uh, a couple notes about that. It says that your account will only last for seven days when you make it. That's not true. It'll last forever. Um, also, there is no way to reset your password. So write it down somewhere. <laughs> Those are my tips there. Um, if you want to talk more about what kinds of photos you're interested in finding, please send me an email and I can help you track some stuff down. Not all of our photos are, dig are digitized, but everything is available to be uh, photographed for reference. Great. And yeah, just on that topic, I have contacted you many, many times for reference photos, especially recently as we plan our public programs for spring 2024. And it is a great resource. Um, and Ruby takes some very clear reference photos. So if you can't come into our um, into our reading room, the reference photos are certainly a wonderful option to conduct your research. Okay, great. So another question um, just on the topic of digitized materials. Is there any, so obviously not all of our materials are digitized. Is there any way um, for people to figure out what is and what isn't digitized other than just looking? Um, in the catalog, is there an overall rule for what is and what is not digitized as of now? Yeah, I mean, so overall rule is a little bit tricky um, because we are like, it's an ongoing process of what we're digitizing. We're like always digitizing things. Um, the large collection of our, like largest collection section of digitized material we have is the uh, Vilna collection. So everything we have from uh, pre-war Evo has been digitized and is available online. So those are, um, our collections are called RGs, short for record group. That's RGs one through 99. And then the 8,000s um, and a couple more in the middle there. Um, yes, Julia just linked to the Vilna collections website. That's a great resource. Um, but in general, if you want to see everything that's been digitized, we do have this great little widget. Um, I hold on. I will send. <laughs> I'll put a link in the chat. Julia, do you know where it is? Um, I. OK, here we go. So. I can share my screen screen again also. Um, because this one's a little bit tricky. So this is the standard page for the archives and library uh, collections. You have to scroll all the way to the bottom, which is a little bit funny. But when you get here, you get to this list of all of our digitized collections. And these are all linked right here. Um, you can scroll through, view them all. You see there are a lot. There's a lot here. Um, this is a great resource if you just want to get a general sense of what's there. Um, I highly recommend using it. Uh, it's it's there rather than in the catalog because there's not an easy way to sort for what's digitized in the catalog, but um, this is a great alternative for that and definitely worth checking. Thank you so much for asking that. It's a great question. Great. Um, so we have some other questions about contacting you. Um, and so we have the Calendly link that I will put in the chat again. Um, and that one is to make an, a, a a virtual reference appointment with you. Um, so if I want to make a virtual reference appointment with you, what do I need to prepare beforehand? What kind of information do I need to give you in order for you to best prepare for that appointment? Um, what's really good for me is if you tell me all of the research you've done so far and what you are hoping to find at Evo. Um, of course, sometimes you don't entirely know what you're hoping to find, but uh, it really helps me if you tell me what you already know, what you don't know yet. Um, there have been appointments that I have prepared for where I wasn't clear if the person who I was meeting with had had done much research at all. And I came in with some uh, very rudimentary sources uh, to find out that the person had actually done hours upon hours upon hours of research and had already exhausted all of these sources. Um, so if you can tell me what sources you've already been consulting and, and what you're hoping to find, um, that will help me to prepare. Um, I do like preparing for these. Um, but worst case scenario, I come into it blind. If you don't send me anything, we can still work something out. It's, it's a journey. I, I will help you with your research. Great. 
Um, so we have another question just about using um, archives.cjh.org. Um, so this is the, there's the, the CJH website, which gives the more broad overview. And then there's this archives website, which gives, which is a deeper dive into um, what's in the finding aids and what we actually have in our archival holdings. So someone just wants to um, see an example, again, of using this website. Um, this particular person typed in a, a um, city in Ukraine, um, and a lot of information came up, but this particular person cannot figure out how to narrow down the information um, that they are looking at and what exactly is there. So would you be able to just do a brief example to show um, sure. how to best wrap your mind around these search results? Yes, and I'm seeing that question. So I'm seeing the name of the town as well. Um, okay, uh, that's, yeah, this will be a good example, I think. Um, okay. Okay. Um, is this the archive uh, website you were talking about, or uh, um, I, I'm unclear a little bit from the question whether this was um, about our archives.cjh.org or if this was about when I was showing off uh, how to use archive grid. Um, is can I confirm that this is about what we have here? Okay. In any case, with what we have here. Um, you'll see that we get one search result. Well, we get two search results, but one is about, about the general subject of the town. Um, and one is, is listed as a series, right? So this is in the Yivo Landsmannschaften records. Um, so those are the immigrant benevolent societies I was talking about before. If I click through here, um, this collection is not in and of itself um, a collection of archival materials. It is more of a directory of where to find uh, materials on Landsmannschaft in these different places because they're often under slightly different spellings of names. Um, so here we see Naraiv and then we have Congregation Bene Isaac Narayov. So if we click there, we can scroll down and find that that is in RG 1713. And we also get this new spelling, Narayov, which might be useful to us. So if I go into a different tab and if I search Narayov, then we get a few uh, more results. It's actually the same information, but now we're seeing um, the page for that. Uh, no, this is the same thing. Um, but now we see that listed as an organization and we'd already seen that we have this um, RG 1713 for this. So if I search, if I search here, I should be able to do a new search and search RG 1713. And here we have this collection <laughs> and I can click into this. Sorry, this has been a few steps. Um, I, I'm much better at this one. I'm not talking through it at the same time. I'm trying to do two things at once here. Um, but you'll see, we get a little bit of biographical uh, information about this uh, immigrant association. And then we also see how uh, the size of the collection, uh, how, how big the collection is. So that's almost a foot. This is probably, I'm going to guess, one five-inch box and one 2.5-inch box. Um, so a sizable amount of information, uh, not too bad. Um, it doesn't really tell us that more about what's uh, that much more about what's in here. Sometimes we'll have more information, sometimes less. It really depends on the collection. But if you wanted to request this material to view, you would use this number here, RG1713. I hope that makes some sense. I realize I've tripped, my, tripped over myself a few times here, um, but this is something that is not digitized and does not really have a full finding aid here. Great. Um, so just on that same wavelength, that's sort of, that's a good segue to another question we have about our Landsman Shofton records. Um, so you said that there's no finding aid for them. So is there a way to know um, what inf info can be accessed in the Landsman Trofton records, especially if people know the names of the burial societies um, of their relatives that they're hoping to get more information about? What exactly do we have within that record group? Um, so it really depends on the society. Um, these are entirely based off of donations. Landsman Trofton are interesting because sometimes we will get all of the material from a given society, and sometimes all of the material from a society will be 
in someone's basement for a long time. It's the type of material that people don't always think to donate. And um, they should because <laughs> we love to have it here. It's very useful to us. Um, but if we have uh, material in a given society, often the um, the page that you'll be able to reach on it, the resource for it, even if it's not a finding aid, will have some description of what's inside. The one that we just saw didn't have much of a description, but often they will. Often it will tell you this has uh, treasury ledgers, this has membership records, meeting uh, minutes. Um, sometimes it'll say this has um, a cemetery map. Uh, cemetery maps are often really useful to people or uh, grave deeds. Um, uh, those can be useful for it, sometimes people will still uh, own a plot of land in um, from a Landsmannschaft in a cemetery, and then you have to go and uh, be able to prove that. And if we have the record of that here, then that's one way to do that. Um, we don't have records of everything, um, but you can often see what kinds of thing we have, things we do have. And if not, uh, you can see the extent of the collection, like I said, the physical size of it. Um, and quite frankly, the bigger it is, the more likely it is that we'll have what you're looking for. Um, but, uh, when in doubt, you can just ask me and I'll go look for you. Great. Um, and on that same topic, you mentioned briefly about what linear feet means. Um, and that essentially lets us know how big the collection is, um, how many actual feet it takes up within our archive. So is where on our website, we, we saw it a few different times on the CJH website, but where is a good place to look for how big a particular um, record group is on any of the websites that you showed us? Okay, yeah, I'll show you again. Um, so see, we're still in the records of Congregation B'nai Isaac Naryev. Um, and if I scroll here, it says extent, and that's where we find that, 0.83 linear feet. But then if we were to go to search.cjh.org and find something like when it loads, okay, find something like RG8, um, then I could click here and I would scroll down. This one has a lot of information on it. Um, this one, do we have, okay, this one does not say. No, I saw uh, it on this physical description a little bit up. Oh, thank you. <laughs> There's so much information <laughs> here, <laughs> which is great. Yes, 39.4 linear feet. Um, so this one gets more specific. 99 boxes, 2,281 folders, and approximately 1,000 posters. That's a lot of material. And this, this is something that's also useful to see when you're planning on coming in and researching because it gives you a sense of how much of a collection you will be able to get through in a day. Um, sometimes people will give themselves a day to come in and look at like 30 boxes and then they come in and realize that that's way too much <laughs> and that they need to either be giving themselves more time to be here or to narrow down what they're looking at significantly. <laughs> Um, so that's a great point, Julia. It's um, it's really useful to look at the extent of a collection before uh, you dive in. Okay, great. Um, so we are actually out of time. Um, there were a lot of fabulous questions here that we are unfortunately not going to be able to get to. Um, so I think just to end, it's something that pretty decently sums up the remaining questions that we have. Um, a lot of these questions are very specific to people's research interests. So what is the best way to contact you? I know that you that we have reference at evo.org, which certainly will reach you. Um, but say I wanted to give you a phone call and I wanted to talk about this over the phone. Is that okay? Can I just walk in and ask to speak to you? What is the best way to contact you that works best for your own workflow and the way that you conduct research to help out um, any researchers? Thank you for asking that, Julia. Um, I would say, first and foremost, email me. <laughs> um, I'm good with email. Email is great. If you really want to talk to me and speak to me, then set up a reference appointment. Um, sometimes people will call me and there are cases where that makes sense as something to do. Um, but generally, I prefer an email or a reference appointment that I can plan ahead for. Um, 
if you call me up and you're asking about what we have on a on a given material, I'm having to hold my phone like this and I'm having to type and search for things or I'm having to say, I'll call you back in a few minutes and go up and get something. And all of this can be made much, much easier and is better for my schedule if you email me or if you plan a reference appointment ahead with me. Um, I do not come in do not come in to speak to me. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I should have phrased that a bit more gracefully. Um, I, I do these reference appointments entirely virtually. I do my email entirely virtually, um, as do we all. Um, if, if you need something in person, if you really feel like you need something to happen in person, email me and uh, I will see what I can do but um, all of these things are things that have to be scheduled in advance. Okay, great. I mean, so it's, what it seems like is that if someone were to call you um, or to even come in person and ask to see something, your response would be to just email you anyway, because you still need the time. I would probably to... say, oh, I'll look into that and then I'll email you. <laughs> yeah, so it sounds like email is certainly the best way. Um, that is good to Absolutely. know. And I will put your email in the chat again, um, very e easy to remember, reference at evo.org. Um, and Ruby will certainly um, respond and help you out with your research question um, if you send her an email at that email. Um, so that is unfortunately all the time we have. I see a few more great questions that came in um, that I will get to once the program ends because those are pretty simple for me to actually answer. Um, so thank you, Ruby, so, so much for joining us for today's program. Um, and if you have any questions, please send either Ruby an email at reference at evo.org or me an e email, or I mean, sorry, not me, my colleague August an email at info at evo.org. Um, and we will be sure to respond to you. And this there will also be a recording of this program so that way you can share it and watch it again and get all this really great information that Ruby gave to us today. So thank you so much, Ruby. Thank you to our audience for joining us. And we hope to have many happy researchers in the coming months, weeks, years, um, all because of this wonderful resource that you have provided. So thank yeah. you all. Thank you all so much for coming. Have a great rest of your day.